Hi everyone, welcome back to Mayor Time. Today I have with me one of the foremost experts of Patek Philippe in the world, John Reardon. John, thank you so much for coming on. It is such a pleasure and honor to be here. Thank you so much. Yeah, first time we got you down to Watchbox headquarters. Finally, and I have to say, I just had a tour and, uh, and my eyes are just, <laughs> I'm, I'm blown out of the water of what you're all doing here. The magnitude of it and um, just from the workflow for the volume of watches that you're your intaking and selling. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. And hopefully only getting better. So uh, in addition to publishing a book on the brand, Patek Philippe in the Americas, John has seen the brand from every angle. He worked for the brand at Henry Stern Watch Agency. He worked for an authorized retailer for the brand. He worked for an auction house, Christie's, and now he runs his own business, Collectability, uh, where he sells Patek Philippe watches and accessories. So there's probably no one better to offer their insight on how the brand has changed over the last several decades and where it may be going moving forward. So uh, let's, let's do it. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much for the kind words and uh, I look forward to getting into this conversation because I, I hear there's some tough questions coming yes, my way. Yes, yes, this will be fun. So how has perception of Patek Philippe shifted over the last 20 years? Well, after I joined uh, Patek Philippe uh, USA, Henry Stern Watch Agency, that was in January of 2001, it was a different world. So I'll go back into my mind of what it was like in, in 2001. It was, uh, it was a different time. And this was pre-September 11th, and uh, the watch market was, uh, was sizzling along, but not, not like it is today. And I remember... Um, myself and uh, Kevin Unger, who, who you know, <laughs> who's um, at Henry Stern Watch Agency to this day, mm -hmm. we were the two sales reps, and we would um, canvas the U.S., visiting all the retailers, uh, offer training seminars, and uh, offer balance inventories. But ultimately, we were there to sell Patek Philippe to the, 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 store, the doors, as they were called. Now, there are some retailers, such as Godberg, who understood what Patek Philippe meant and for generations um, Patek Philippe was part of their DNA in, in the United States. But there are other retailers, I'll tell you, who did not get it. <laughs> Most of them are, are no longer selling uh, the brand. And that, that was the toughest part of my job. I don't want to name any cities in particular, <laughs> but there are places I would go. You would you'd be doing a sales call and you'd sit and wait two to three hours for the honor to meet the store owner <laughs> with the goal of getting their inventory up to 20 pieces, 20 Patek Philippe's in stock. I was literally begging for them to buy at wholesale 5711s, 5065s, 5066s. And I was thrilled if I could walk out of the, the store with a order of three or four watches wow. as, as a sales rep. So in short, this is a good segue of what it was like back, back in the day. It was, it was very different. Right. And, uh, and Hank Edelman, um, who was president at the time, he always gave, uh, gave me and uh, Kevin good advice. He's like, there's some days you're not going to make any sales. And when you're going to the airport and you just feel really down yourself, go buy yourself a tie. And to this day, I remember, you just go buy a tie to cheer yourself up. <laughs> and uh, yes, I have a closet full of ties to this day. <laughs> and we don't even wear them anymore. Right. Um, all right, fast forward to today. It's a market that, I mean, here we're sen sitting in the the epicenter of watch trading here, here at Watchbox, it's a different market. People know prices, they know values, they know where to find uh, what they're looking for. There are, social media is not only educating, it's exciting the market in ways we've never seen before. And Patek Philippe in particular is just experiencing a renaissance that I don't think the brand's ever had before. Mm -hmm. So in short, it's a whole different story. The bookends of these 20 years it can't be underestimated, and uh, it would be a good book someday. That's so. for sure. <laughs> Write another one. Yeah, I mean, I remember when I first started, uh, when I had the honor of carrying Patek Philippe 2007, um, I would have said that the face of the brand was a 5970, mm -hmm. a perpetual calendar chrono, precious metal on a strap. And now, today, for better or for worse, I would say the face of the brand is the Nautilus. And there are so many other incredible offerings that the brand has, whereas 
some other premier brands really only have one mm -hmm. model. You know, Paddock has so much more to offer, but segues nicely into my next question uh, for you, which is, do you think the popularity of the Nautilus and Aquanaut has transformed Paddock's identity, much like sports models have transformed the overall watch market in recent years? Wow, your second question is, is a tough one. This feels like I'm in 2020 right now. <laughs> so, in no way do I want to criticize the amazing success of the Nautilus and the Aquanaut. But I very clearly want to say, in my personal opinion, these two watches don't represent what Patek Philippe is all about. It's, Patek Philippe is not a, a mono reference or mono family type of uh, brand. Um, we think of other companies, you think of their signature watches, and that you think of AP, you think of Rolex, you know what they make and what they're all about. But Patek Philippe has a, a variety of styles, designs, and complications that historically has never been done before. And it's one of the reasons I love the brand so much. And this is the same way if you go back 100 years ago, they weren't just known for one particular style. It was ladies' watches, it was complications, it was pocket watches. 100 years ago, it was also wrist watches. So today, there are multiple families. There's, there's gondolas, there's ellipse, which I hope we talk about today. Yes, yes. Um, there's, uh, of course, the complications and the grand complications. It's not just Nautilus, it's not just Aquanaut. Right now, it's experiencing a moment. I mean, we're just seeing price appreciation that is shocking, it would be an understatement. Yeah, head scratching. Yes, but um, the brand is not just about those, those two uh, references. And, and Terry Stern has said it publicly over and over again. It's like, we're not just about those two um, families. I mean, there's much more to it. Clearly, as he pulled the plug on the 5711, which was a, uh, a brave move. Very, so, um, yes. I'm excited to see uh, what, uh, what comes to, to replace that and what uh, is in store moving, moving forward. So before we dive into uh, models specifically, what resources would you recommend to collectors who want to learn more about Patek Philippe? Great question. I think there are a lot of, there's a lot of new blood coming into this, this world, people that want to learn more about watches. And if you want to specifically learn about Patek Philippe, there's obviously Patek.com. I mean, that's a great place. And their Instagram is quite interesting too. They've really ramped up uh, their Instagram. You could learn more through their stories about the history. Um, there's also something that a lot of people have forgotten that exists, and those are called books. <laughs> books are a wonderful resource to learn about Patek Philippe. Here, here uh, behind, uh, behind me on my right is a, a copy of the Patek Philippe authorized biography by, by no, no other than Nick Falks, and this is a book everyone should have. Um, if you want to learn about the brand, you need to have his book, you need to have the, the Bible, the Huber and Banbury book, um, uh, Patek Philippe. Um, if you have a copy of Patek Philippe in America by John Reardon, <laughs> highly recommend <laughs> Only 1,500 of them. Though, yes, so. and impossible to find at this, <laughs> at this point. Um, but books are a wonderful resource. But beyond that, online there are some other ways that you could dig in and learn more. Obviously, Watchbox is a wonderful, through your videos, your content, everything that you do is a wonderful way to learn about the brand, especially on the modern side. On the vintage side, I have to plug Collectability, mm -hmm. my Absolutely. company. What we focus on is an education in vintage Patek Philippe. So there are a lot of people that want to understand, okay, what's the story of pocket watches? What's, what's the story of buying a piece from the 19th century? How do I buy my, my first ellipse? Or, or can I actually buy a Patek Philippe under $10,000? I mean, that, you can go to my site and you can learn about those questions and more. And I like to uncover the secrets of the brand from the past by interviewing people that um, have worked for the company, watchmakers that, uh, that still to this day um, do some amazing work for, for Patek Philippe, and, and that's what collectability is all about. One warning about where not to learn about Patek Philippe. I have mixed feelings about Instagram. There are certain places on Instagram, such as, I'm just thinking of some wonderful places to follow, uh, horology, Anxian. Mm -hmm. I mean, just, this is just a, uh, an Instagram everyone should follow. It's literally an education in, in collecting uh, watches. Um, there are other, I mean, you have to just be mindful and uh, that a lot of people are trying to sell you something on Instagram all the time. Mm -hmm. Now, if you're a watch box or collectability, obviously we're in the sales business, but we're also in the education business. 
there are a lot of people that are putting misinformation out there to, just to sell you what's in front of them, and then, and then life moves on. So just know where your information is coming from, dig deep, and always fact check from right. multiple sources. So that's, that's how you learn about Patek Philippe. It's a community, and, uh, and there, there's so much you could learn um, just by speaking to people, visiting auction houses. And, uh, and my last, last point, I have to bring up the, um, the Horological Society of New York. If you're not a member, absolutely want to join, take their watchmaking classes, watch their lectures. To truly understand Patek Philippe, you need to understand independent watchmaking today. You need to understand uh, what other brands are doing. So you can really compare and contrast and, and collect what you love. And, uh, and that's the beauty of the HSNY. It's, um, it's, it's not set in a certain time and place. It's, it's, it's all watches. It's all things horological. Um, no, that was great. I mean, some people uh, seem to forget that you can't believe everything you read on the internet. While there's a lot of incredible information, there's a, a lot of falsehoods out there. So, um, you know, be careful what you, what you trust and, and validate. Absolutely. So, uh, let's get into some specific watches now. Um, we have some, some cool pieces out here. Uh, what pieces would you advise Patek Philippe collectors to buy in today's market, both current and discontinued, mm -hmm. and which pieces would you tell them to consider selling if there are any? <laughs> that is another tough question. That's borderline a gotcha question, <laughs> um, but I'll, I'll do my best. Um, you, everyone's heard this before. You have to buy what you love. Buy something that you've studied. Buy something where you understand the market. Buy something that you want to, to wear, because no matter what happens, you're going to at least have the watch at, at the end of the day. I am, am horrified that I'm seeing a lot of collectors, collectors that I love and respect so much, that are talking about values first. Mm -hmm. They're talking about, oh, did you hear that this went up 20, 30% in the past two weeks? Right. That is not healthy for a marketplace. It's not healthy for a collection. And uh, in some cases, it might not end well. Um, if someone, I mean, all day long, people are contacting us asking advice, asking that question, what should I be buying? What should I be, be selling? And I really listen to them first. I want to understand what they're in it for. And if it becomes a conversation about money, it's, the conversation's over with me. I mean, I'm just not interested in having a conversation speculating what Reference X is going to be worth in one month. Nobody knows. Um, a year ago, if you asked me where 5711s would be today, <laughs> I would, have, I would have laughed if, 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 if I knew, if I had a crystal ball right, to, see, right. to see the reality. But my advice that I give to, to collectors starting out is beyond buying what you love, buying what you know, buying what you understand, is try to buy something that has a wonderful story that everyone else is not telling and everyone else is not talking about. And there are a lot of opportunities in, in the watch world in general, not just Patek Philippe, where you can buy a story, or sorry, you can buy a watch for $500 as an amazing story to tell. I started collecting Walthams and Elgins and uh, Hamiltons and absolutely had such pleasure out of that when I was buying those um, back in the day. And today, I still love that treasure hunt of finding something that someone hasn't seen before. So specifically, uh, I've become a bit known for a, as a big promoter of the Ellipse, which is pretty shocking because they were impossible for us to sell when I was at Patek Philippe. Less than 1% of all production was the Ellipse. And when I started the company, our, our logo and our icon um, was all built around the Ellipse and telling that story. Because I do believe the Ellipse has a more pure Patek Philippe story than I dare say the Nautilus, which has that, that Genta thing going mm -hmm, with it, mm -hmm. uh, which is still out of respect. But a, a, a Patek Philippe Ellipse is it's pure Patek Philippe design from 1968. They built their brand from it post Quartz Revolution, 1970s and 80s and even early 90s. It was all about the Ellipse. And, and this is something that I think now people are only rediscovering. And um, sadly, Ellipse prices are starting to just, not skyrocket, but they're, they're beginning to go up. As they should. They should. They, they, they were one it. of the best values for sure. I yes. mean, I love the new, the 5738, mm -hmm. the more contemporary case size. I mean, that watch is awesome. I would love, and it's a fraction of what, uh, you know, in, in platinum, attractive. what, uh, yes. you know, or in rose with the black dial, a fraction of what a, mm -hmm. a steel sports model is going for in, in the secondary market. So I think that's definitely a good value. It's, the ellipse is a good case study 
and it doesn't have to be your thing, but some, every one of us can find our own ellipse of something that what we love that we want to dig deep. And whether that's um, pocket watches from the, the 1870s, ladies' watches from the 1950s, or maybe just men's time onlys, um, like these amazing rectangular cases from the, the 40s and 50s by, uh, by Markowski, who was one of their greatest case makers. There's so many different rabbit holes to go down. I just really encourage collectors to pick you, make your choice, master your market, and then build the most amazing collection you can. And it could be two, three, four, or five pieces. It could be hundreds of pieces. You'll still be able to have that same pleasure at almost every price point. Right. I know we were just talking about the market sum and, and values. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, you have now a 5711 1R trading at around the same level as a 5370P, which, you know, I mean, 5370P, yeah, I mean, you know, I do think there are inefficiencies in the paddock market specifically. I mean, a 5180 here, um, skeleton dial piece where we were saying, you, you were like, you're asking how much for that? Like, you know, shocked at how low it yes. was, you know, for precious metal, white golds, they, uh, you know, I don't think they've done many skeleton pieces ever. And, um, you know, again, a, a fraction, or less than half of a, of a 5711 steel. So um, there are definitely values inside the line when, you know, things are going for crazy prices, largely sports models. So, and I think for new and, and veteran collectors, you just answered it better than I could. It's, <laughs> it's all about dislocations in the marketplace. There are many market segments within Patek Philippe that you can buy. They're, they're just logically based on supply, demand, workmanship, the story, condition, completely disconnected from what other pieces are bringing in the marketplace currently. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and the higher that I see Aquanauts and and, and Nautilus go, I think it, it's gonna help like rise the tide for everyone. Mm -hmm. uh, and, right. and that's exciting to, to see that happening in the marketplace. It's still early enough, I think, to get in to the world of Patek Philippe without being priced out. Um, I speak to some people, like their first watch they want is a 5167A, it's quite typical. Right. I don't recommend that as your first watch buying today at secondary market prices. I mean, because you just, you could build a whole collection of other pieces from a different period with that same amount of money that it's is true. just completely incredible. It's really so. crazy. You know, I remember the days when that was a $13,000 watch. Yes. You know, now <laughs> creeping on 100, insane. But uh, talk about this watch, John. I think uh, this, this 5089, uh, which is a really, really uh, special piece, um, came out uh, as part of the Grand Exhibition mm -hmm. in New York. Yes. Um, and uh, um, marquetry piece, wood, uh, you were you were telling me about it. I think you you could describe it better than I can. Um, but this is another piece that I think is so special to Patek Philippe. All their um, marquetry, mm -hmm. you know, handcrafts pieces that are seemingly overlooked. I think you know, um, drowned out by the whole sports model craze. But talk about that, and then all, you know, other handcraft sure. pieces. This is the first time that I've seen one in person not behind glass at an exhibition, right. et cetera. And uh, I have to say, I'm almost nervous holding it because <laughs> this is, for me, what Patek Philippe is all about. In a marquetry dial, when the 5089s came out, it was, it was 2014, they were first um, cloisonne enamel dials. Um, I, I, I just bought a 5089 with, um, it's not the Titanic, but it's a steamship okay. come into New York Harbor. So it's the same, um, the same shape, same case, same everything, but a very different dial. But a marquetry, and for those of you that went to the, um, the New York exhibition and saw the marquetry being done, which I know you were there, mm -hmm. um, in person, it will just blow your mind away. It's, it's done on, uh, it's almost, uh, I think it's 0.6 millimeters thick gold pleat, and then they cut these tiny pieces of wood, thousands, and make it, in this absolutely stunning design, in this case, uh, of the Grand Canyon. Um, we just, um, uh, my colleague Tanya Edwards in Collectability wrote an amazing article, how these dials were made in great deep detail that's on our site. So if you want to understand this 5089, you have to read Tanya's article, and you'll never look at these again. And frankly, you might never see one again, too. So right. it's, uh, yeah, I think they only made 10 of them. And that one has like a real Americana feel to it, you know, which was perfectly fitting for the New York Grand Exhibition. So. And when you told me the price, um, wouldn't be surprised if we talk after this, because <laughs> I think there's incredible value in this. Even for me being in the trade, 
this is the kind of watch I want to own and, and put away. Um, and they're still, I mean, they're not bringing significantly over retail in right. this case. I right. mean, they're, they're actually really fairly priced on the secondary market when you can get one. So coming from the auction world in your past, what watches would you recommend that people sell through an auction house as opposed to through a secondary market dealer such as Watchbox or Collectability? Wow. I'm going to try to answer that as fairly as possible as a former longtime employee of both Sotheby's and, and Christie's because I understand the auction game. I understand how they make money. I understand their margins at the end of the day. You need to remember when you can sign a piece to auction today, the buyer's premium is 26%. On the seller side, you could expect to pay up to 10%. So there's a huge spread, 36% plus, of every watch that you sell essentially through, through auction. If you're selling a commodity watch, 5970 mm -hmm. and platinum, for example, mm -hmm. we all know what that should bring on the secondary market today, and you put that at auction, you're literally just handing them $70,000 <laughs> as a thank you. Right. It doesn't, it's not logical, it doesn't make sense. Um, when I was at auction, I loved when people would consign modern collections because I knew what they would bring. Uh, we would know the margins, and it was just nice, nice clean, easy, easy business. Um, but if I'm an owner of one of those watches, or even as a dealer, I'm not going to give those to auction because it just doesn't make sense. Uh, there, there are other resources to go to. Of course, Watchbox. <laughs> of course, collectability <laughs> would make sense because we're going to tell you the market price, and we're going to make a fair offer mm -hmm. for, for the price, and it's, it's quick and easy. At, at auction, often a long time you'll be waiting in order to get paid. Right. Uh, it's just the, the nature of the beast. But there are certain watches that should go to auction. And I occasionally put pieces at auction because it just makes sense. I know mm -hmm. I'll do better at auction mm -hmm. than selling it um, through, through my platform. And those are watches that have unique, exciting stories, uh, often fresh to market, that could just um, ignite people's imaginations and open their wallets. Mm -hmm. The Paul Newman, Paul Newman is an extreme example of that. Uh, if the John Lennon 2499 ever showed up publicly, that is a watch that has to go to auction. Mm -hmm, right. I mean, it, right. it, it would do more than, um, I think, at auction than in any other way. People get imaginable. emotional yes. and they have their thresholds and they oftentimes will break that threshold, you know, in, in the heat of the moment, so. But the, the watches that go to auction have to have the right ingredients. They have, they, they, in my, this is just my opinion, they, they need to be unique, they need to be story driven, they need to be something that um, no one will have another chance to ever buy again. Right, right. All right that makes, that makes mm -hmm. sense. Mm -hmm. um, but if you're buying a, uh, if you're, sorry, if you're selling a, a Calatrava, we all know what it's gonna bring, I, I don't recommend going to auction. I know you're very familiar with the uh, very famous Patek Philippe Museum, Museum, which is, you know, if you haven't seen it before, I recommend you, you got it. Whenever you're in Geneva or Switzerland, you got to make it there. Um, it's one of the most um, in, incredible um, collections of anything in the world. And uh, once you're there, uh, what are the most special pieces at the museum in Geneva that you must stop and see? Wow, I'm waiting for Watchbox to go over there and film. Because that'd be a great video. I'll join you. So okay, I that's think, a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> for me, I typically have a pilgrimage every few months to the Patek Philippe Museum in Geneva because it's the most magical place on earth, in my opinion. Um, it's 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 killing me. I haven't been there in a couple uh, sorry a couple of years right. because of COVID. Uh, yeah, COVID. But I uh, can't wait to get over in in the spring. Uh, I do my normal rounds when I go and pay homage to my friends um, in the museum, friends being the watches. <laughs> so what's so incredible about the museum is every time you go back, you find other surprises. For a first time visitor, obviously you're gonna go to like the Graves and Packard case and see some of the most famous watches um, from the history of, of, of the company. The, you want to go to the Grand Complication Room and see chronographs and um, perpetual chronographs that will just blow your mind. Uh, but there are off the beaten paths in the museum uh, of places and uh, watches that you just need to see. And one, which is I think often neglected place that you need to go is the library. You have to understand, like, well, you, you know this already, but one needs to understand that Patek Philippe wasn't built in a vacuum. It's, it's from a history of horology that dates, I mean, 
arguably back into the 11th and 12th century. The books are what really hold the secrets of what made Patek Philippe what it is today. So I always remind people, it's like, go, go to the library, um, just read the spines of the books, write down certain books that intrigue you. You could often go home and buy those on Amazon or um, uh, even on, um, on, on eBay. Maybe not some of the earlier pieces, but they're, they're, this is an important part of the museum that's often neglected and forgotten. But after you go to the library, and I always like spending some time there, there are two Nautiluses I could think of in the museum, and nobody talks about one of these watches. I'm writing an article about it right now, so I'll give a little <laughs> teaser. Okay. Um, we're all talking about Elon Musk and SpaceX and the whole space race. Um, but forget about that. Let's talk about the first Patek Philippe in space. That's interesting to me. Yeah. Specifically, let's talk about the first Nautilus in space. The story gets better. Digging deeper, the first reference 3800, line 1JA in space. So a two-tone Nautilus with a white dial went up in 1992 on a Russian ship, one of the Soyuz missions, and it's now at the museum. Nobody knows it, nobody talks about it, nobody knows the story, so um, that'll be on, on my site soon. So That's really, awesome. Really excited about yeah, that. That is super cool. Um, and it's amazing, the, 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 there's so much interest in two-tone all of a sudden, too. Yep. Total, mm -hmm. total side note. When you're in the museum, also go check out coin watches. They have an amazing case of coin watches. Look at the ladies' watch case. It just blows my mind of the, the architecture of 1940s and 50s ladies' um, bracelet watches. And we'll, yeah, well, we this have is a good one segue. here. Yeah, might as well, right? <laughs> Here's one from the, the 70s. I mean, look at this chain mail link. These, um, uh, what's the reference of this? 4151. 4151. This was one of the more beautiful bracelets made by Akofe, um, which is a great bracelet maker for Patek Philippe. You have this uh, a, a lapis um, a ellipse uh, a dial, which I love, made by Stern Frere. And these are so reasonably priced. Um, I'm gonna ask you after the meeting what, this is, <laughs> what you're asking for that. I mean, this is stuff that I absolutely love. I mean, I'm, I'm wearing, um, these are both from 1974, a great year, I hear. Um, <laughs> that is a look that is quite exciting for, for both men and women. So leaving the Patek Philippe Museum, um, which is a, a wonderful question, uh, there are some books that you can buy on the way out, which I highly encourage. There's um, the catalog resume of the museum, so you can see all of the pieces that are in the museum, if, if they're still available. Um, that is an amazing book, because you could literally visit the museum at your leisure. And uh, one other plug for the museum I have to bring up, they, uh, Dr. Peter Fries, the curator, developed this amazing way to visit the museum with an iPad. So it's actually like a personal tour when you're going through the museum which even for me, it's like a new level of engagement, which is, um, I love having a tour guide, but having the resource to dig deeper, look in movements. I mean, you could literally like play with the watches while you're walking through the museum. I'm a kid in the candy store there, and I know a lot of your, uh, your, your viewers are too. Yeah, I've been there several times, and there's, you can go an endless amount of times, you know, because like you said, you always see something new or pick up something, and um, you get a real feel for the history of the brand that is just, you know, really uh, in a league of its own. And uh, I remember one year when I went there, um, the 5170J had just come out, and I saw a Pulsation's Chrono, um, which made when probably 50s mm -hmm. or 60s, and um, I was like, ah, you know, there it, it is. Like, there's all, yeah, exactly. The 5212, which was designed off of a watch mm -hmm. um, back in uh, 1950s, I believe it was, uh, too. So there's, there's oftentimes a reason behind what Patek Philippe is doing today when looking back at their rich history, uh, and they, that's why they have so many things that they're capable of doing moving forward. So uh, Thierry Stern can say confidently, I don't need to lean on the 5711. We have a lot more to offer, you know? Yeah, and when you go in and you don't see a room full of Nautilus, it kind of opens your, your eyes. Because when you go to the, the museum, I know you felt this, you literally feel like you're going into the Stern's living room. I mean, you're, you're, you're being welcomed by the family into a very like personal space. And, that, and that's what's so beautiful about it. It doesn't feel like you're, you're at the Met or like a larger museum. It's like it's very personal. And I even understand um, uh, Terry's mother, M Mrs. Uh, Gertrude Stern, she designed the aesthetic of the museum from the carpet to the drapery to the bird's eye maple, everything. So this is, is something very personal. And uh, I had the opportunity for the Patek Philippe magazine or with the Patek Philippe magazine a few years ago to 
introduce and spend, uh, not introduce to, interview for a few hours, um, Mr. Philippe Stern. And we spent an afternoon, I just asked him all the questions I wanted to. It was a dream come true. It had to be awesome. It was really, it, it personalized the museum to what it means to him. Because this isn't, this is his personal collection. Right. That's what people right. forget. He's a collector, first and foremost. Um, so I have a, a loaded question for you oh, on this no. one. I'm really, really yeah. interested. A couple more loaded ones, too. So uh, you've done well so far. Thank um, you. <laughs> <laughs> how are Patek Philippe collectors in their 20s and 30s different from Patek Philippe collectors who are, say, 50 and older? Wow. I'm not in my 20s and 30s, and I'm not in my 50s <laughs> or 60s yet. So I feel like I'm right in between. There so I'm going to do so my best play, to yeah. answer that. Look back fairly. and look, yes. look forward. I still remember how to use a typewriter and a phone that was corded. Yet I could also still um, navigate my way around Instagram and blockchain. So <laughs> I'm going to answer this as a, a guy in his 40s, the best that he, he can. In short, there are different philosophies at play. Younger collectors often are thinking of value first. They're thinking of, of monetary value. And I respect that. It's like, okay, I earned 10,000. I want to put my 10,000 in some place where I'm not going to, to lose. So I, I think there's a lot for younger collectors, decisions driven by social media, what their friends are wearing. And um, it has a lot almost to do with like social acceptance. Right. Um, but I have to say, everyone grows out of that really soon. As soon as they, they buy a watch that resonates with them and connects in a, a personal way, a watch that they bought for a wedding, which is becoming a thing, by the way. I'm, I'm noticing more wedding watches than ever I am too. before. Yeah. And it's, I love that. Yeah, I so do too. I yeah. Think, um, Bring back like, you know, the, the sentimental you know, aspect to, to some of these pieces. Because people, uh, they want to have a watch to celebrate an event in their lives. Like right. A marriage, you can't think of one bigger than that. Right. The birth of a daughter or a son is another wonderful thing. So we see people buying watches around that. Um, I love when people have twins because then they buy two. So you see this happening more and more. Again, I would say with collectors generally in their, their, their 20s and 30s, um, also 40s. Um, for, for collectors in their 50s, 60s, 70s and beyond, um, these are ladies and gentlemen that know exactly what they want. They know the market. They often are not buying what everyone else mm -hmm. is buying. Mm -hmm. I have some collectors who are just so hyper-targeted on 1920s Patek Philippe with Marat-style enamel bezels. Like, that's their thing. Mm -hmm. Others that just want to have Patek Philippe clocks from the 1960s and 70s. Um, I have um, some collectors on, on, on the high, high end. That they just want particular 2499s to uh, fulfill these like fantasy um, verticals that they're, they're putting together, which would be like my dream collection. Right. So there's, there's something for, for everyone at all, all, cross, uh, at all price points. But I think at the, at the end of the day, it's very individual, not, not based in, in age. And, uh, and I bring up, um, I just have to bring up, I'm, I'm seeing more than ever before, I'm so happy, female collectors. Um, and they're not buying just ladies' watches. In fact, they're buying men's Calatravas from the 60s, 70s, and 80s because they're perfectly sized, 33 to 35 millimeters. That's um, awesome. This is just, uh, I'm so happy to hear it. When I was at auction, I'd always say, yes, women were buying too. They weren't. I'll just say that it just, it was very uh, uncommon um, in, my, in my past. Now um, it's incredible. Yeah, I think um, pocket watches are making a bit of a comeback. Mm -hmm. I know you've bought out some, brought with you some cool ones. So um, talk about some of these cool pieces oh, that sure. you brought with you. And one of the joys of pocket watch collecting and I was just in Miami for the Miami show and bought a lot of pocket watches. I had so much fun. And this is why it's one of the few parts of collecting where you could still have true treasure hunting, where your uh, knowledge can be one step ahead of right. the, the dealer you're buying from. And this is what's so much fun. All right, if I go to a show and I see 257 11s and they both have box and papers, the decision's based on price. I have to say it's, it's boring. Mm -hmm. But if I go and I see 20, 30 pocket watches and I'm hunting around, I need to know my escapements. I need to know dial condition. I need to know marks. There's so-called secret marks that uh, you, should, you should know as, as, as a collector. And you might discover a Guillaume balance, which the other guy wouldn't know if it hit him in the head. Right. 
and you just bought a watch for 5000 all day long is worth 15000 <laughs> This is what collecting is about. It's treasure hunting. It's fun. And there aren't a lot of people doing it today on the sales side. There are a number of people buying. I mean, I have to say the collecting community has really embraced pocket watches. And the most common question I get is like, oh, John, I'd love to have a pocket watch, but what the hell do I do with it? It's a good question. And I'm going to show you what you do with it. You put it on your desk in front of you. <laughs> And you have a piece that you could put on a, a really cool 19th or early 20th century stand, and you have a desk clock. Um, I think other people, such as myself, if I'm going to an important event, I always wear a pocket watch if it's a wedding. Um, it's, just, uh, it's just something that's kind of fun. When everyone else is uh, showing off the hardware on their wrist, you could take out your pocket watch, and for $15,000, you have a better story to tell. Right, so, right. You could get a chain too, right? Yeah. Put it, yeah, uh, nice, you know, in your pocket. Nice fob. Or, yeah. And amazingly, a lot, just ask your tailor to put in a watch pocket, and uh, you could take out your watch and wind. I mean, just I can yeah. listen to the sound. I mean, that. Awesome. That's what it's it. all Makes about. Makes you want to close your eyes. <laughs> yeah. Just, yeah, it's something soothing about it. Um, so what we have here is uh, I brought three pocket watches. This this one we were just looking at is from uh, circa 1900. It's a chronograph. Um, so you can imagine the original owner would have been timing his horses. This is before the day of cars, so right. most likely be timing his horses with that. Um, then I have two pocket watches from the, the 50s. I have a platinum reference 600 with the Black Star and Frost retail signature, which is um, just beautiful. It's a mint watch from, uh, it's like 70 years old. And then I have this little 752, um, this little gilt dialed watch with its original papers. And this I've never seen before. This is a certificate book um, from uh, circa 1950, which tells you how to care for your Patek Philippe, offers the warranty. But you'll see it's not just from Patek Philippe, it's also from Montgomery Ward, the Chicago retailer, catalog seller. I and mean, this is like before the days of, of, of Sears taking over the world. Um, so it's fun to see how Patek Philippe in America was distributed at that time. It wasn't just your high-end family retailer. They were going to the, the, the big box stores of the day. It's like uh, finding a paddock at Costco. Mm -hmm. so. Right. Yeah, I love seeing co-branded pieces like that. I mean, obviously now all the rage is Tiffany, and, but there are lots of other uh, co-branded pieces out there that are, you know, uh, overlooked that uh, have a really cool story behind them. Um, so those are, those are awesome. So I have to ask you, you know, you have a bunch of paddock branded Items here, obviously, watches, lighter. What's the story with this? You know, I believe it says Rolex on it as yeah, opposed to Batek. I, I think I do see Rolex on, <laughs> on the dial, and uh, I have to admit, I'm not really known as a Rolex specialist, um, but this is quite special. This is a 1970s desk clock from a Rolex bench, a, a official Rolex bench believed to be in Switzerland, because we've seen these appear a few times before. What people don't realize is the, the movements of this um, subsidiary clock system are tied to Patek Philippe master timing system. Famously, and actually I should say I wish it was famously, years ago, when I, was I, I was always had this great relationship with Hodinkee, and years ago I used to write quite a bit, and I wrote uh, an article titled, Who's Your Master? And it was about these, it was about um, Patek Philippe clocks made for Rolex. Because it really just captured my imagination that the Rolex watchmakers who are timing their chronometers to a clock that's a Patek Philippe based system. I love that. I mean, there's a lot of romance. I mean, this green, it's clearly Rolex. Um, the, these clocks are, or these subsidiary clocks are, are really cult collectibles. They show up at auction, people go nuts. And uh, I finally chased one down, and this is the one I keep in my desk, nice. in my office. And it's, uh, it's my uh, homage to Rolex. A brand that I love, but my first and only love is Patek <laughs> um, I'm going to end with, my, I think, my most loaded question. So um, what do you predict Patek Philippe will come out with at their very first appearance at Watches and Wonders uh, next month? Well, I'd be thrilled if they brought back lighters. <laughs> 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 I think uh, a Patek Philippe lighter would be quite fun, but that's not going to happen. Yeah. I honestly have no idea. I can hope 
that what they're going to they're going to build on annual calendars. I'd like to see them right. do more with annual calendars. Well, they discontinued a bunch of them, right? It's the 5146 it, is 5396 is so it would make sense. It would be logical. Right. And and I think the so-called small complications make sense in a big case. So I think we'll be seeing that. I um I'm curious where they'll be going with sizes of watches will be getting a little bigger, a little little smaller. I'm seeing in my business, um, and you probably are too, that people are more accepting of smaller sizes, time, especially yeah. especially men wearing smaller watches. Mm -hmm. I mean, 33, 34 millimeters, no problem. A few years ago, it, it wasn't much. Um, people weren't embracing it as much. But uh, the brands just keep getting bigger and bigger. So I think we're, we're moving away from the hockey puck generation. Right, right. So I'm hoping to see smaller case design. We're all hoping for a new Nautilus. We'll see. Right. Right. Back to that point on Instagram, I don't believe what I read on Instagram, but it'd be fun if some of those rumors were true. Um, do you think they would ever do uh, a different metal right out of the gate, like titanium? Um, for example. Uh, uh, it would be nuts. It would be. Earthquake. It'd be fun. <laughs> it'd be fun. I, uh, I, I would like to see that. I think uh, it would make sense. It's a classic, um, particularly if it's historically fought fire with fire. So if they saw a lot of unique dials on the marketplace, like we saw showing up at auction 10, 15 years ago, then they released even more unique dials like for the, the Saatchi Gallery uh, London exhibition. And that, that destabilized, not destabilized, it just kind of it ignited the market. But it was, particularly very aware of what's happening with the Nautilus. So I think their next move will be quite logical. I have my, I have my personal guesses, but I'll, I'll keep my mouth shut for okay. now. Yeah. So fingers it, crossed. It'll be, it'll be very interesting, that's for sure. Um, something that I think is cool is uh, I don't think that uh, Terry Stern is scared of taking risks. Obviously, yes. you know, he could have uh, ridden out the 5711 for many more years. I mean, stronger than ever. Um, I remember when he came to Philadelphia and we had an event uh, with him. He says, you know, I'm coming out w with something uh, in steel that I'm sure is going to do really well. And it was the 5960 in steel, mm -hmm. which, you know, that was first came out in platinum. That was something, you know, and it was like, oh, and, and at that time, sports models hadn't taken off yet. So uh, it wasn't, you know, a, a sure thing like it would be now, right? Anything in steel when you switch to 5905 to, yeah. to steel. And um, it wasn't like overwhelmingly popular. I mean, it sold well, mm -hmm. but it wasn't like gangbusters. Um, I actually think it's one of the better values now in the market, you know? It's true, but the secret's out over yeah, the last few yeah, months. Yeah, Oof. yeah, exactly. But, but still, there's room to grow there with the 5960s. But um, it, they, there's so much they're capable of doing, like we talked about, you know, going back into their archives. Mm -hmm. um, and I believe that they've held back a lot of watches. I know um, at the last Basel, that was 2019, when the Singapore Grand Exhibition was mm -hmm. later that year. So I remember... Um, hearing them say how, how they had a bunch of different models lined up and, and production was like, are you kidding me? Like, how are we gonna come out with all these pieces when we have to make the pieces mm -hmm. for the grand exhibition? And then COVID hit in 2020 and then, you know, canceled Basel World again in 2021. So they've had a lot of time to prepare for this one. So I think this is gonna be a, a really, really good one. There's just um, endless opportunities on, on what they can do. And uh, I'd love to see a new world time, you know? Um, oh, that would be nice. You know, um, it'll be interesting to see what they do, 5930, you know, mm -hmm. um, whether they do a, a world time chrono, but uh, it'll, be, it'll be exciting, that's for sure. So, John, thank you so much. You know, it was just great hearing, uh, you know, about your experiences and getting a glimpse of some of your knowledge, you know, to get more, Go to Collectability, um, super nice guy, and he will uh, share his knowledge with, with anybody. And uh, it was a real pleasure, so I, I really appreciate you coming on. Uh, thank you, George. It's been an honor. <laughs> Thanks a lot.